good to see you today. That old hymn is just kind of rolling around in my spirit today. And I'm excited that you're joining me. And I'm excited that you're coming to finish up this Rebuilding the Ruins of Worship. I am excited because we are three chapters from the end of this series that we've been doing for a few months. And let me put my hymn book over here. And grab your Bibles, grab your um, workbook if you have one, grab your uh, book and your Bible, and off we will go right into chapter 15 in the series, Rebuilding the Ruins of Worship, as we jump into, what an amazing chapter, The Bridegroom is coming. Hi, Tamara. Hi, Janice. Charlie. Laura, I knew you guys were busy today, but I'm glad to see you. Hi, Sunny. Lisa, good to see you, my darling. And all of you who I see uh, numbers but not names, thanks for joining me and reminding everyone to keep praying for Pastor Dave Kokenauer, for Pastor Frida White. We are expecting miracles there. Continue to pray for Lori uh, Taylor, my dear friend, from the uh, apostolic work up in Santa Maria of the Healing Rooms, Pastor Lori Taylor, believing God for a miracle there, and God is on the move. Absolutely, I feel His presence on the move. I feel like God is absolutely about ready to come on the scene and do a great thing for all of us. So, everyone, hi, Sonny. Good to see you, sweet girl, and yes, Miss Janice from uh, Janice from my South area, right? Miss Janice, Janice Creech, tell me where you're from. I'm trying to remember Alabama, right? I believe that's right. Join me uh, in the book of Esther. We can easily see the prophetic outline of the last day's preparation and purification of his bride. We can see that the timeline is not specific according to our time clocks, but rather God's mercy and grace play a huge part as he waits for us to be made ready. So he is awaiting our being made ready. But according to the word I was reading this morning in, in my uh, Dakes Bible, uh, thank you, Miss Tammy, uh, I was reading there that that time is set, absolutely set, but it's all because God has already been with us in the future. He knows when the bride will be ready. That date is set for Jesus to come. But no one knows what date it is except Father. Because he's already been with us in the future. His desire is to come for us when we're ready. He is not going to send Jesus before we're ready. But there will be those who no matter how much time you give them, they'll not stay ready. We spend our lives thinking we are waiting on him when in all actuality he waits on us to get ready, to be prepared, to get saved, to endure, to overcome, to push through, to not give up, to not be weary, and so forth and so on. He waits for us. So even though you may feel like you're waiting on Jesus, Jesus has been, is, and will always be waiting on you. And also reminding everyone, please pray for Tammy's mom, Cookie, who uh, hurt herself running to answer the phone. She tripped, twisted her ankle, hurt her back. She's in a lot of pain. She's 77 and needs a miracle healing. So if anyone would jump in there and grab Cookie's name for a moment and let's pray for Cookie as we pray for baby Odin and we pray for, um, give us an update. I don't see if Tammy's there. Yep, Tammy, there you are. Give us an update on um, the little three and a half year old, Austin, I believe. Give us an update on him if you know anything. How is he doing? And let's just keep reading and praying and spending our time before the Lord, before Jesus is coming. And that's what this chapter is all about. The bridegroom is coming, but what's my part? We can clearly see that Jesus Christ is not the holdup in his coming, but rather it's our slowness in being prepared for him. Look at Acts 3, verses 19 through 21. And this is the scripture I'm always quoting about heaven holding Jesus back. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. How about that? We need times of refreshing, and they will come when we repent and uh, are converted and our sins are blotted out. 
So those times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, but we have to learn to embrace the presence of the Lord, house the presence of the Lord, stay in the presence of the Lord. So these times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive, and one translation says hold back, heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Jesus is ready to come and get us. We are not waiting on him, even though for some of us it feels that way. He is waiting on us to be prepared, to be restored, to be purified, to be made ready, to be stepped in, to stepping in our place of, of priesthood and kingship. He is waiting on us to repent, to be converted. He is waiting on us to ask for our sins to be blotted out. Heaven is holding him back as he does not come for us until we are ready. Makes me so tickle when I think about how precious our little grandchildren are. Uh, when Mia gets ready to do her prayers now, she told Papa the other night, she said, uh, Papa, I feel more like I should pray on my knees and not just in the bed because I, I want to show reverence and honor to God. And she always asked the Lord to forgive her of her sins. And it just so blesses me that this little eight-year-old, and she asked the Lord to help her live holy. She asked the Lord to help her do better each and every day to be more like him. And it makes me think, you know, if an eight-year-old can approach God like that, what should we be approaching God like? I think we need to abandon our lists of gimme, 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 my name is Jimmy, and ask the Lord to forgive us to repent, to be in a constant state of repentance so that we can stay humble before the Lord. He is waiting on his bride to be all about him and no longer about herself. He's waiting for the bride to know his voice, to hear his voice and respond to his voice. But we remain more like the woman in the Song of Solomon story that we read earlier in this book. Our feet are washed and we've lain down in the bed. He knocks and puts his hand on the door. We know he's there, but we can't make ourselves get up. We can't seem to make our flesh respond, our soul to respond. We must wake up and arise and go to him when he calls for us. So what is my part in becoming the bride? What is my part in becoming the veil? It is multi-purpose depending on what stage of preparation I'm in with my worship. When the veil was torn in two parts down the middle, as Jesus said, it is finished. My place is to accept him as my Lord and Savior, stepping into my rightful position as a part of the veil. Brides wear veils to cover their faces as a symbol that they have no more identity of their own. Wow. Becoming the veil is a higher level of worship which separates the impure and unprepared world from the holy power and presence of our God. As we step in our position of the veil, as prophesied in Acts 15 through rebuilding the ruins of worship and becoming the tabernacle of the Lord, that's what I was studying today, all the Hebrew and the Greek words for temple and tabernacle, we can see the parallel to the history of King David's reign and how he changed worship. Worshippers replaced the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the inner court. We became the separation. We became the veil. When we truly step into our last day's prophetic calling to become the veil of Christ, his bride, and thus his body through our restoration and rebuilding of worship within our own personal lives, we can see the return of the Lord. It is imminent. Jesus is coming. There's no more time to waste to get ready or prepare. It's here. I know that this can sound confusing while reading if you're thinking simply on a linear plane of thinking. To understand what I believe was sealed up for the last days within the writings of the Bible, for us to see now... Yes, things were sealed up thousands of years ago and unveiled or revealed to us today. 
we must think vertically and multi-dimensionally, and we need to think more this direction rather than this direction. This is life on this earth, absolutely, but this is life in the spirit realm. We are ever circling upward and upward. That's why Elijah left ever circling upward in a whirlwind. That's why we see the angel said, why do you stand staring? The way he left is the way he's coming, vertical. He left this way, he's coming this way. He left this way, he's coming this way. Elijah left this way. Jesus left this way. Jesus is coming back this way. When we truly step into our last days prophetic calling to become the veil, his bride, and thus his body, through our restoration and rebuilding of worship within our own personal lives, we will see the return of the Lord. I know this can sound confusing. To understand what I believe, we have to think multidimensionally. We have to think vertically. How can we be both the veil and the bride? How can we be the bride and his body? We can. We are. It's our purpose. We are the veil. We are the bride. We are his body. We are his. H-I-S. Once we understand our position and we marry our Messiah, no longer our own, but his, then we can abandon our traditional thinking, and realize that we are simply and completely his. So anybody and everything that pertains to him, I am. I am his body because I'm hidden within him. I am his bride and he and I are one because I marry him and choose to be his. 100% his. He is mine and I am his. There is no separation, no two becoming one. We are one because we have become one over the many years of my pursuit of his presence, of my hungering and thirsting after him. Once I realize this total abandonment of my own being and become his alone, then all else does not matter. Hi, Van. Thanks for joining us. Nothing happens except his will his purpose, his call, and his voice. Once I step into my rightful position and become the veil, the separation between humanity and the presence of God, understanding that I am nameless and faceless with no identity, then I gain the freedom through Christ, we're hidden in Christ, to allow others who are not ready to meet the Messiah to look upon my life and see him. That's my responsibility, for I am crucified Christ. It is, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So when they look in me, they see him. He's alive. I'm not there anymore. We are the shield, so to speak, that allows sinful humanity to gaze upon the holiness of who he is through our lives each day. God's presence was given to the earth to touch humanity. The shoulders of the priest were to carry the presence of God, not a cart and not animals, not down low below our heads, but up above our heads, above our thinking. As we take our positions, shouldering our part to bring his presence in our everyday lives, we see the ultimate sacrifice. Esther was a little orphan, rejected girl. After years of preparation and purification, she was chosen as queen. After five years of living within the walls of the king's house, she fasted and prayed until she could take up her cross and follow his plan, as Jesus so aptly put it while he was on the earth. Once she became the image of the king, then he married her. Jesus marries us when we take on his image, when we fulfill Chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 26. Let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make mankind in our image. And let's give them complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the tame beasts, and over everything that creeps upon the earth. So God created them, male and female, he created them. And he gave them complete authority. But it, be, it starts with us becoming his image. God made us to carry his image, to house his image, to be the mirror reflection of the Godhead to the world around us. But until we become that, we cannot be his bride. 
He's coming for a bride just like King Xerxes did not marry Esther until she became his image. Jesus marries us when we become his image. Once she became the image of the king, he married her and then truly became one. Thus, his offer to her for half of the kingdom makes perfect sense. It belonged to her at that point because they were one. She no longer was Jewish, but she married a Persian king, Xerxes. And once she married him, she had no fear for her life anymore, for she was no longer Jewish and her life was not being threatened. She was Persian now because she was married to him. But now, as the Persian queen, she can stand in the gap for a people because her own life is no longer threatened. She's not begging for her life. She's begging for God's people's lives. What are we doing? Are we begging for the lives of God's people? Are we crying out, standing in the gap, praying, interceding for the lives of God's people? Because until we do, Jesus cannot come. For that is the bride he's coming for. Just as Ruth, a born Moabite, once she married Boaz, a Jew, and she became Jewish, she was listed within the lineage of Jesus Christ, the sinless Messiah. We, who have been born into sin, can marry Jesus, our bridegroom, and our king. When we marry the king, our destiny, our eternal DNA, can be also changed forever. Hmm. Our name changes. Our destiny changes. Even our eternal DNA changes from condemned to redeemed. The story did not end there for Queen Esther, though. In fact, in The Last Day's Prophetic Bride, the story truly began in chapter 5. Esther was now one with the king. She had her robes of eternal identity and authority on, and she took charge right away. She understood her authority, and she took her position. So many times in the body of Christ, I think we understand our authority, but we don't take our position. If you have authority and don't take your position, there's no reason for you to even have any authority. You're not doing anything with what you have. She invited the king to come to dinner. Talk about a change in a little girl to a position of queen. She invited the king to come to the banquet that she had prepared for him. She also asked the king to bring the arch enemy of her people, Haman. The king sent word immediately, and that always makes me think of Psalm 23. You prepare a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. The king sent word immediately for Haman to come quickly, and the two of them did as Queen Esther had requested. At the banquet of wine, the king asked Esther again, What is your request, Queen Esther? Queen Esther was in full charge at this point. She knew who she was created to be. She knew her rightful God-given position, and she was not driven by fear at all. She was not in a hurry, but listened carefully to the leading of the presence of God as to how to approach each and every move with cunning battle. She waited again. We could learn wonderful tactical lessons of spiritual warfare from this little 10 chapter book if we would learn to not be in a hurry. Being in a hurry can cost you certain battles you were destined to win if you would have been willing to wait. God is strategic, a strategic battle planner. Each and every victory has already been won within him. But if we get ahead, if we run ahead, if we're afraid, if fear is a part of our battle plan, then we may suffer several defeats. Learning to wait and be still, listening more and talking less could be a great lesson in spiritual warfare. She waited. When pressed by the king concerning what it was she wanted from him, she simply requested that he and Haman come again the following day to another banquet that she would prepare for them. They accepted, of course, and Haman became so puffed up with pride that he was completely blinded to the trap set for him by Queen Esther. Haman was being set up for destruction by his pride. Not by the queen, by his pride. He had so much hate in his heart against God's people 
and specifically Mordecai, that he was not thinking clearly. Even though Queen Esther had not revealed to anyone what her nationality was, she was in contact constantly with her cousin Mordecai, and anybody who knew anything, who paid any attention at all, would have known that. Whether her meetings with him were held in secret or not, the eunuchs knew for sure that her cousin was feeding her information from outside the king's walls. Mordecai had given her word that there was a plot to kill the king and Esther had passed it along to the king, saving the king's life and gave Mordecai the credit for it. But at that time, nothing was done to honor Mordecai for his heroic effort in saving the king. While 24 hours were ticking past and Haman was so puffed up with his newfound position with the queen, his hatred for Mordecai boiled within him. Wouldn't you think that he would pay attention to those around him? Wouldn't you think that he would notice some details? Wouldn't you think that he would know about the foil plot to kill the king? He was the king's most trusted advisor and closest confidant, right? But this is what happens when your life is ruled and directed by hatred and self-consumed. You miss some of the greatest details that were meant for you to see. Haman had not put the pieces together that were staring him right in the face. He went home after the first banquet with the queen and the king, and he started bragging to those closest to him of his honored position. He began to think that he was untouchable. Mm Mm-hmm. Don't ever think that. And he could do anything that he wanted to do without any fear of conviction or retribution. He let his anger seethe against Mordecai because Mordecai would not bow down to him. His wife and friends encouraged him to not put up with this kind of behavior and that he should build a gallows 50 feet or 50 cubits high. And in the morning when he was to meet with the king again, he should suggest his desire to hang Mordecai on them because he would not bow down to him. Not the king, to Haman. This pleased Haman of what his friends and his wife had suggested, and he did just that. He had those 50 cubit gallows built for Mordecai. The next morning, when he went in for his meeting with the king, he was all set to ask the king for his permission to kill Mordecai. But God was already at work making a way of escape, as he always is, for those who love him, namely, in this case, Mordecai. The king could not sleep the night before, so he had the book of records brought to him and read to him. I don't think that our God ever goes without sleep, but I do think he has the book of records read to him on a regular basis. He quickly discovered that Mordecai had saved his life with information of the planned assassination of the king by two of his doorkeepers. Just as the king was putting all this together in his mind, and he decided he wanted to honor Mordecai, he asked, who's in the court? He was told that Haman was waiting to see him. So he asked his servants to bring Haman in at that moment. Now you have to remember, nobody could come in to see the king without being summoned. Haman had not been summoned, but he was waiting outside because he was going to go see the king without being announced, without being invited. He was waiting outside to go in. Hmm, hmm. But let, look what God did for him. As Haman entered the room with full intentions of asking for permission to hang Mordecai for his insolence against him personally, the king asked Haman what he would suggest the king do as a sign of honor to a certain person. Of course, because Haman was so full of pride, Every thought he had was consumed with himself. He assumed the king wanted to honor him. So Haman laid out a beautiful plan of honor. In Esther chapter 6, verses 7 through 9, it reads like this. And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one 
of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Haman's own words, because he thought it was for himself. Be careful of thinking of you. It can get you in trouble. The king loved the idea and immediately told Haman that he was to go and get Mordecai whom the king desired to honor. And Haman was to be the most noble prince to parade Mordecai around the city square, crying out the statement Haman had prepared for his own honor. This shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Haman obeyed, but was thoroughly humiliated and in mourning or grief over this. Mordecai went back to the king's gate But Haman hurried to his house with his head covered. He was in mourning and grief. At this point, his wife and friends who had helped him make a great plot against Mordecai warned him that Mordecai was a Jew and that Haman was about to fall himself. So much for your friends or your wife in this case. Don't surround yourself with people who are friends when you are being honored but can't be found when you're going through hard times. Those are not friends at all. Look for people who are like-minded with you. Look for people who love to worship the Lord and love to praise and that praise is continually in their mouths and in their conversation. And be very careful when you're conversing with someone how often they point back to themselves instead of to God. Surround yourself with people who love to worship God. It's time for the banquet with Queen Esther and the king. So Haman was hurried off by the king's eunuchs so he would not be late. In Esther chapter 7 verses 1 and 2, I find it quite interesting that the timeline given at this point is on the second day. Think about Jesus being crucified first day. Now we're on the second day. Here we are on the second day. It's the second day of invitation from Esther. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine. Now, it was the ninth year within the kingdom for Esther. One year preparation, three years of waiting, then five years, one year of preparation and purification, three years of waiting, then five years as queen. So we're in the ninth year. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We're in the ninth year of Queen Esther. And remember, nine is Holy Spirit. In the ninth year within the kingdom of Esther, it's the fourth day after the fast. Remember on the third day, she got up and put on her own royal robes and she went and stood because she was a dead woman already. So she's standing in front of the king and the king asks her, will you marry me? She comes forth, touches the tip of the scepter with her acceptance of the invitation of marriage. Yes, I will marry you. The I do's were said, boom, she's not only the queen, she's not only been in the kingdom for nine years, she's not only been the queen for five years, but now she's the wife of the king at the ninth year. Now, she fasts and prays for three days. On the third day, she arises, presents herself, gets married to the king, and the first day, she gives a banquet that day. Then the second day, and that's the day we're on right now. So it's the fourth day after the fast had begun. But to make this such a point in the timeline as to call this the second day is quite interesting. This is a perfect example of God's timing. We may live our lives on this earth for years and years, not being identified with the King of Kings. We may be in church all of our lives, wear a cross around our necks, assume we are Christians because we are Americans, or simply because we are not something else. But in God, time begins for us when we die to ourselves and become one with Him. The reason it was the second day is it's Esther's second day to be married to the king. Time begins again for you the day you take your vows to be one with him. 
once Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king without fear of death, she took on his identity and she took on his authority. For Esther, she may have had the title of queen for five years, just like many people are saved for many years before they finally become his. Time begins again when you become one. Remember how Jesus prayed in John 17? Oh, that they may be one as we are one. It was his prayer for you. It was his prayer for me. When the king saw himself in her and she truly became his image, then for Esther, time began again and so for you. For us as Christians with a life lived for him, we must learn to let time begin again for us. We must not live our lives looking back on what could have been or what should have been. We must let the Lord so change us from the inside out so we have a new identity in Christ. Old things have to be passed away. We can't just keep living a new life as the old life continues to exist. The old life must stop existing so that the new life can be lived. And we must allow our things, all things, to become new. The reason I believe this timeline of the second day was given because it was the second day of Esther's new identity. She was now in her rightful position, in her robe of righteousness and her garment of praise. She was not moved by circumstances or situations surrounding her. She was not afraid to die because she's dead already. She was not being rushed by the fear of death through the edict that had been written and sealed by the king's signet ring against her people. She was listening. She was waiting, waiting on God to show her what to do and when to do it. At the banquet, the king started asking her to reveal her desire to him as his desire was to bless her. He continually reminded her through his words that they were one. And she could receive up to half the kingdom with only a word of request. All you have to do is ask. Her first response to me is the most astounding of all. She began by turning all the attention back to the king. She began by rehearsing his words already spoken to her, repeating back to him from her lips what he said. That's what we do in antiphonal worship. That's why we sing the word. That's why we speak the word. That's why we live, walk by faith and not by sight, allowing the word of God to become alive and active and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword in our lives. Look at her words in chapter 7, verse 3 and 4. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, wow. and, and if it pleases the king, hmm, let my life be given me at my petition and my people's lives at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Sounds like the devil, doesn't it? Kill, steal, and destroy. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. Mm -hmm. Now she is being super wise. For now she's talking to the king about his financial status, about his tax status about the finances for the kingdom. What a genius way to approach the king as his queen. First of all, she defers to him. She reminds him that she would not even make this request except he had said that she found favor in his sight. This one phrase is a reminder to him that she is his image and that he extended his scepter toward her and saved her life only the day before. She further showed him great respect when she stated that her sole purpose was to please him in every way possible. This is Spiritual Warfare 101. You must keep the attention on the king and not start begging and pleading. We must 
continue to keep our eyes locked on his eyes. Then the last and greatest tactical maneuver was to tell him that she had thought about this at great length and had it not been found to be to his detriment to him personally and to his kingdom, she would not have even brought this up. She would have just allowed this law to go on and all of God's people to be killed, including herself. And this is her tactical statement to him. This is not about the lives of the Jews. This is not about the lives of God's people. This is not about the lives of, of my life either, King. I'm only bringing this up because I've weighed it out and laid it down in measurement. And this move will very much harm the kingdom and it will harm you personally. What a shift from the scared little rejected orphan who was afraid to even go before the king to this authoritative and extremely beneficial strategist for the king and his kingdom. Queen Esther, the great tactical strategist of warfare. She told him though, through every, <clears throat> through very few words, that this killing of the Jews would most certainly hurt the revenue stream of taxes within his kingdom. She told him that her life was worth absolutely nothing to her, nor were the lives of her people, except to be a benefit and a help to him as king, to him personally and to his kingdom. She told him that no matter how much money had been given to him to kill all the Jews, it would not match the long-term giving of taxes to his kingdom that would be lost if all of these people were annihilated. Of course, the king was shocked and surprised, and obviously he had not thought this all the way through as she apparently had for his benefit. He did not even know what she was talking about at that moment and wanted an explanation of what she was referring to. First of all, after nine years of waiting, his chosen queen had become his queen. They are finally one in their relationship, in their marriage, and in their position. His extension of the royal scepter is a prophetic gesture for all of us to see ourselves moving from one position of life to a higher level of spiritual authority and oneness with the king. What would you dare ask today? Psalm 110 verses 1 and 2 states in the Message Bible, The word of, of God, the word of God to my Lord, sit alongside me here on my throne until I make your enemies a stew for your feet. You were forged a strong scepter by God of Zion, by God of worship, by the way. Zion means worship. You were forged a strong scepter by God of worship. Now rule, though surrounded by enemies. Now rule, though surrounded by enemies. Your people will freely join you, resplendent in holy armor on the great day of your conquest, join you at the fresh break of day, join you with all the vigor of youth. I love that scripture. This is a prophetic look at the Messiah, Jesus Christ, taking his rightful position at God's right hand while he is withheld in heaven waiting for his bride to be made ready. But it also gives us a perfect glimpse of the meaning of the scepter in the king's hand as it was extended to Esther. It's obvious what it did for her. She received new life, a new destiny, a new bloodline as the queen of Persia. She became in every sense of the word Persian by marriage. She took on his royal bloodline and his ultimate authority became hers with his words of the gift of up to half of the kingdom. And today, even today, Queen Esther is known as the greatest queen of the Persian people. Now apply that to us as God's worshipers, his people, his bride. When we say yes to follow Christ, we're given the authority, the position, the bloodline to be one with him. 
But most of us don't understand what has been given to us, and so we don't actually live in it or take our position of it until we learn to live as who we've been made to be. Life, circumstances, and situations happen, and we forget the gift given to us of old things have passed away, and all things have become new. We continue to walk as if we're still bound, dealing with the old feelings of unworthiness and unforgiveness in our souls, as if we've not been freed at all. We have been given a gift of freedom, and we say we've accepted it, but we still don't utilize it. It's as if the door of the prison has been unlocked, but we still hover in the very back of the prison, afraid to come out. That does not diminish the fact that it's been given, but it does diminish our everyday effectiveness living day in and day out within the kingdom of God when we don't appropriate what's been given us. At any point, Esther could have stepped into the role the king had given her by his choosing of her to be his queen. But it was not about his choice to offer it, but ultimately about hers to accept what had been given her. Just with us, Jesus has given us all authority, but have we accepted it? Are we walking in it? Do we even try to practice it? Many of us say we love God, say we're born again, say we know Jesus Christ, but still let earthly fears cripple us each day as we think more about who we are not rather than focusing on who he is. Once we get it's straight in our heads and our hearts and our souls of who he is and that we can become one with who he is, then we can ultimately understand how we can step into our robes of righteousness and our garments of praise. It's because of him that I'm wearing it. it he earned the robe and now he allows me as a gift to wear my righteousness because it was his righteousness and now I wear it as his bride. Not because we can earn them, no. We never can earn these positions. We receive them by marriage. We receive our position because we can become one with the one who deserves them. Now hidden deep within Christ, I can fulfill my destiny to be his image and no longer try to fulfill my destiny of who I once was as an old person of this identity. I shed my identity, and I put on his. Esther admitted what she needed from him, but she did it with such eloquence and control that all women everywhere should study her elegance and her grace in the face of massive destruction. She began by telling the king that she had pondered this situation long before she brought it to him. My husband Harry used to run a huge company with thousands of employees, he would say that, that if only 1% of his employees had a problem that day, there would be over 30 people lined up outside his office to unload their unresolved issues. I remember a little wall plaque he had hanging on his wall just outside his office door. And it said this, Don't bring me a problem unless you already have the solution. Hmm. This is what Esther did when she finally presented her request to the king. She had prayed it through, considered her options, weighed out whether it should even be presented to the king. Is this even worthy of the king's attention? If it were simply slavery, maybe she would have kept quiet, she said. But she considered the long-term detriment to the king personally and professionally. Her heart was about the kingdom and what this decision to kill all the Jews would cost the king and the kingdom. Maybe she implied that this might not be the image the king would want to convey to the surrounding kingdoms. After all, she knew him. She knew he was not like the image Haman was about to present of the king to the surrounding kingdoms as a killer. She also talked turkey with him when she told him of the long-range detriment this would mean to the tax situation and the tax structure and the financial bottom line of his kingdom. Esther was not dumb. She knew how to approach the king and she learned how to talk his language. When you are approaching the realm of eternity and going into the throne room of God to worship him, 
you need to learn to talk his language. You need to know if you're approaching Father or you're approaching the righteous judge. You need to know if you're petitioning or declaring or decreeing or interceding. We as a society have tried to dumb God down to our level. We don't want God on our level. We want to come up higher to his level. As the realization of the full weight of the situation began to come into focus for the king, he asked who would dare to do such a horrible thing. In chapter 7, verse 5, we read, So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? Hmm. Esther did not hesitate. I doubt if she even raised her voice. She did not have to give it more thought. She did not stutter or stammer. In verse 6, she stated, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Esther had adhered to the old adage, Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Esther did not make her statements behind the back of her enemy. She faced her enemy head on. She kept her enemy right in front of her face so she could keep an eye on him. And that's all scriptural. What does it say in Deuteronomy when you're walking in the blessing? God will cause your enemies to rise up before your face, you see. If you're always facing the right direction, your enemy will always be in your face. But if you turn your back on God, you put the enemy at your back, not a good place. Not a good strategy. Face the king. She played her part perfectly in the scene of prophetic words for the last day's bride's position. She was not afraid or intimidated. She knew who she was, what her position of authority was. She knew the king loved her without reservation. She made sure the king could trust her, that her heart and her motives were purely driven for her life must be and was all about the king. The king was so furious that he rose and walked out into the palace garden for a moment. I would imagine he wanted to kill Haman with his bare hands and was applying the old parenting skill of counting to ten to cool down. Haman, realizing his fate was sealed, stood before Queen Esther and started pleading for his life. He was so nervous and scared that he fell across Queen Esther's lap while begging for his life. This made the king even angrier that he dared touch or even talk to his queen, his wife. The king walked in and saw him falling across the couch where Queen Esther was, and he said in verse 8, Will he also assault the queen while I'm in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, <laughs> I love this, they covered Haman's face. Oh, my Lord, like pulling up in a morgue over a dead corpse. The eunuchs just mm, covered up his face. He's dead where he stands. He may still be breathing, but he's dead. What a gesture this was. The servants covered Haman's face. What could this signify? When a body's found dead at an accident or even while being prepared in a mortuary for burial, what is the proper thing to do? Of course, cover the body, including the face. This one simple gesture suggested that Haman was dead already. He was hanged on the gallows that he himself had prepared for Mordecai. This is what will ultimately always happen to the enemy of God's people and especially the enemy of God's bride. When we become the veil of Christ, separated and standing in the gap for those yet to be redeemed, we have an awesome responsibility to keep our hearts and minds pure, our motives pure and holy, and our lives pure as we continue in this position as the veil. Esther and the Jews were not released yet. The law was written. Even though the author of that death law was dead already, the law could not be reversed because it was sealed by the king's signet ring. The only hope, just think about Jesus. The only hope was that a new law was written and sealed, a law that gave God's people a way of escape. A new law had to be written that would give God's people a way to protect themselves from the old law. 
Oh, glory to God. If this is not prophetic of Jesus, if you are a born-again Christian and you have not seen the prophetic parallel in this story, let me spell it out for you. Adam in the Garden of Eden gave away humanity's freedom to the deceiver, Satan. The law of sin and death became the law of the land. And through much hardship, persecution, sacrifices, offerings, rituals, and priests to stand in the gap for humanity, we could find our way back to God. However, it was not easy, but extremely difficult to live by the law. But from the beginning, God was making a plan of escape for humanity, for he always knew the law of sin and death had to be, couldn't be reversed. It had to be a new law written that would give us an opportunity to be bought back and a way to be redeemed and a way to protect ourselves. And do we take advantage of the redemption? We do. But do we take advantage of the protection that God has given us? Seldom. God's people act unprepared, untaught. They act like they are not armed. They act unarmed. For God so loved the world, he loved humans, that he was planning a way of escape for us all along. He sent Jesus, his only son, to pay the ultimate price for us. Jesus Christ, the sinless lamb of God, was slain. His blood was shed for the remission of our sins. Then when he gave up the ghost of human spirit and said, It is finished. Instead of being absent from the body and being present with the Lord, Jesus went to hell for us. Jesus the Christ was the only person who ever died that deserved to go to heaven. But he went to hell. We all deserve to go to hell. But because of the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I can choose to go to heaven with my acceptance of my redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ, God's only son, went to hell for me, I get to go to heaven. He took back the keys of the law of sin and death. He took back the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He took back the sounds of. He took and silenced Satan and took back the sound of accusation. He took back the sound of, of deceiving. He took back the sound of hell. He took back the sound of death. He defeated every sound that Satan had and silenced him while he was in hell. He overcame the accuser of humanity by standing in the gap for us, becoming our high priest. Now here is the key for me in the ultimate prophetic last day's bride book of Esther. Esther was born a Jew, but lived in a foreign land all her life. She became one with the king of Persia and took on his identity and his destiny. According to Jewish law, she no longer is a Jew after she married the Persian king. Just as Ruth was no longer a Moabite once she became one with Boaz in the book of Ruth and is named in the lineage of Jesus. What does all of this mean to us? We're born in sin, born with a sin nature, and the DNA of sin is in our destiny. We can be born again through Christ Jesus, our bridegroom, and learn how to take on his identity and his destiny, which is heaven instead of hell. Once we are one with Christ, we have no more past. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. We have a new name and a new future. In this story, Esther, who was born Jewish, took on a foreign destiny through her oneness with the Persian king. She would no longer have to suffer the destiny of the other Jews, which was death under the law of Haman, a fate sealed by the king's signet ring. But Esther chose to take the punishment along with her people. She was determined to figure out a way of escape for her people and for herself. Esther stood in the gap, pleaded for the lives of the Jews, and then after the enemy was destroyed, she still fought to bring restoration to her people. She worked with the king until a new law was written, 
and distributed throughout all 127 provinces, making a way for the marked for destruction people to live. Chapter 8, verse 8 reads, You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. Glory. God's chosen people wrote a law and the king's scribes recorded it in every language necessary to be read throughout all 127 provinces of the land. The Jews could legally fight anyone trying to hurt or destroy them. They could wipe out the enemy if necessary to preserve their people. The king said, and just think about today, hello, and what's going on in Israel today. I want to read that statement again. They could wipe out the enemy if necessary to preserve their people. The king said that they could destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that tried to assault them, and that they could take all their possessions too. Huh. And this is what they did. They fought against the enemy. Anyone who would dare come after a Jew, they fought against them. And Thousands were destroyed who sought to hurt God's chosen people. You see, even after Haman was killed, there was still this hatred of God's people among thousands of people. And we know it because thousands went after to kill them and thousands were destroyed. Hmm. So even after the one who wrote it was destroyed, the people still lived by it. Wrap your brain around that. Our enemy is not people. Our arch enemy is the devil and his demons. The Bible calls him the prince of this world. But he is not the prince of my world. Jesus is my king. He's my prince of peace. I know who I am in Christ and I am learning to walk in his authority every day. As long as my worship is about him and I am dead to myself, then his authority rules and reigns in my life. And the prince of this world may be the prince of the world, but he's not the prince of my world, for I live in the kingdom. My worship is an indication of whose image I am. If I belong to Christ, I will worship him to the level that I abandon who I used to be to become who I am hidden inside of my Savior. So I'm encouraging you today. I know that was a long chapter, but I just want to say this statement. Jesus is my king. I know who I am in Christ, and I'm learning to walk in his authority every day. So don't be defeated if, if, if you missed it or you didn't walk in your authority for a moment or a time or a week or whatever. Start again. You have that authority no matter whether you lived it, no matter whether you believed it, no matter whether you understood it. It's still yours. As long as my worship is about him and I'm dead to myself, then his authority rules and reigns in my life. My worship is an indication of whose image I am. If I belong to Christ, I will worship him to the level that I abandon who I used to be to become who I am hidden inside of my Savior. And then there are so many pages of questions that will help you just really master this chapter and get your authority in position in place. And then you have to grab your workbook and go through that. Powerful, powerful soul. And I noticed in a comment uh, in the last couple of days, someone said they ordered this book on Amazon. You ordered the workbook from Amazon, but you can only get the book from SalemFamilyMinistries.org right now. So you can order the workbook on Amazon, absolutely, but you need the book. And the book and the workbook you can get from our website, SalemFamilyMinistries.org. It's right there on your screen. And you can get it ordered and you can continue to go back through the playlist and do this chapter by chapter. Once we finish with this, I'll go back and we'll start a whole new series called I Am a Worshipper. So while you're ordering this book and workbook, maybe you'll go ahead and get I Am a Worshipper book and workbook also at the same time. So you'll be ready for our next series.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace today and always. May you walk in his glory and his healing power. May his authority be always within you. And you know that you know that you know who you are inside of him. You'll never fear again, but you'll walk in the power and the authority that God has placed within you through Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to bringing the next chapter to you in the next few days. I'm hoping to finish this before we take a little break and go on a trip to four states. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, three states and four stops. We'll start in Bartlett, Tennessee with Pastors James and Melissa Farmer, and then we'll go on and see our board members around the Nashville area and have a board meeting. Then we'll drive all the way down to Douglas, Georgia and be with the Popes. I'm so excited. We'll be doing a Wednesday night and a Thursday ladies night there. Then we'll drive on over to Zachary, Louisiana, which is right outside of Baton Rouge, and we'll be with our pastor friends, Pastors Rocky and Jody Bizet. And all of these places, we We've not been in a long time, ever since before Harry was sick, and for some, even before COVID began. So I'm excited to be in all of these places, and then I'll be back, and we'll start I Am a Worshipper. In the meantime, this week, be watching. Make sure you give me a thumbs up. Make sure you hit the little notification bell, and make sure, please, a lot of people watch me that are not subscribed to our channel. I look look and see that on the analytics, and it helps us so much if you would just subscribe. So click that little subscription right there in front of you. And if you can't do that, that means you're not signed into your Google account. All you have to do is sign into your Google account, click that little notification where it says subscribe, click the little notification bell. It's all free. You can watch without it, but it helps us if you watch with it. You can leave comments if you subscribe. Now, for those of you who watch regularly and those of you who've come with me today, please, I'm about to post this. If you would please do me a favor, YouTube has done a new algorithm thing and all of the lives don't count. So thank you for joining me live. Would you go back and watch it again? Would you put your comments again? Would you please put your responses and your feelings and, and what God is telling you? And would you continue to pray for Pastor Dave Kokenauer for all the pain to go in Jesus' name? Would you continue to pray for Pastor Frida White for all the cancer to go in Jesus' name? Would you continue to pray for Cookie for all the pain to go in Jesus' name? Let's just keep believing God for miracle signs and wonders. Don't forget about my niece, Mary Catherine. I'm expecting a miracle for her, a full-blown miracle where she can walk and talk and give God all the glory. Continue to pray for my cousin Marcia, for my cousin Bill, and also for my dear friend, Pastor Lori Taylor, for a miracle in her body as well. So many people to pray for. When you don't know what names to call, just pray in the Holy Ghost. He knows. Bless you.